Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nikus Neyman. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Crest Advisory Africa. We are based in, in South Africa, um, in Johannesburg, and I'm going to be leading you this afternoon um, under the topic, the impact of security operations management in, on, in and on enterprise risk management. I'm going to be addressing firstly who I am, um, some definitions, internal and external stakeholders um, that one is working with, um, whether you are in the security operations management um, area uh, environment or in the enterprise risk management um, area. And then I'm going to be, to be addressing two um, case studies um, of experience that, that I had over the last two years, um, the human rights and uh, ERM, the use of force, subcontractor management and anti-corruption, and then internal audit and security um, environment. And then I will hand over for questions. Just a quick overview of myself. Um, I was a policeman in the South African police uh, for about 25 years, serving in the pre-apartheid as well as in um, the post-apartheid um, era. Um, I was based uh, in the intelligence services with covert operations uh, from 1986 till uh, 1998. And in 1998, I was appointed as a brigadier. It is a senior rank in, in the police in Midlands area of Soweto. Now, Midlands in Soweto is, is a is, is a black community. I am a white policeman. So um, for a white policeman to be working in a, in a, in, in a black community as a stakeholder, um, that is, that has got its own challenges. And um, so I was part and parcel of the overt um, policing environment. And I was managing a community of over 500,000 people that we were, that were living um, in my environment. Secondly, in 2007, I was appointed as the executive risk um, and security manager for the Gautrain um, project. Now, the Gautrain project was at that time one of the biggest projects globally between the time period of 2007 and 2011. And in 2009, I was appointed um, for the Gautrain uh, to be on a shared basis between the construction and the, um, to set up the operation um, systems for the rapid transport system um, and to get everything in place for the opening um, two days prior to the World Cup of 2010. And I was the, until 2013, where I was the enterprise risk manager and responsible for the security environment. In 2014, I established Crest Advisor Africa and we're specializing in risk management um, specific, specifically on the ISO standards and in partnership with the PCB based on ISO 31000, internal audit ISO 19001, compliance ISO 19600, business continuity ISO 22301, and quality that is ISO uh, 9001. Just, just three definitions that I want to go through. Um, at this time is I just, um, in terms of ISO 18788, security is defined as the condition of being protected against hazards, threats, and risks, and or loss. Now, now that is, if, if one is looking at a security environment, you need to be looking at hazards, threats, risks, and loss. And that has to do with specifically assets, um, human life, and, and anything that is internally and, and externally part and parcel of the security mandate. Secondly, if you're looking at risk, the definition of risk as defined in ISO 73, as well as in ISO 31000, it is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Now, that is a very simple 
um, definition of risk and 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 it is it is um, giving you a, a very nice um, focus on the objectives if you if you take it back to the security environment it has got a specific um, objective of protecting the assets of the company the people of the company and everything um, in terms of that and then objectives objectives in terms of ISO 18788 is defined as the result to be achieved now um, every result in a security environment um, whether it is internal threats whether it is external threats whether, whether it is internal vulnerabilities or external vulnerabilities that can have a major impact on uh, and and consequence on the business as an entity and on the risk management as a whole now if if you're looking at at that specifically um, and we are, we are correlating that into the business environment a security structure is usually not part and parcel of the the operations or maintenance or the core business security is usually a support system to the core business in any environment so security supports business security needs to be aligned with business security's objectives need to be aligned with what the business um, um, drives to achieve in the environment whether it is within a transporting environment whether it is in a, a, a logistical environment whether it is in um, an aviation environment mining environment it does not matter security is there to support business but if security goes wrong it can have huge impact on the reputation of the business on the operations of the business it can have a definite financial effect and specifically it will it will have a legal and um, a, yeah a, a legal impact that you are going to be busy in in in, in liability um, uh, processes for long for a long time I want to to address as well the internal and the external environments specifically on ISO 73 just to set the basis there now an internal environment in which the organization seeks to achieve its its ob its objectives that has to do with firstly governance organizational structure roles and, and accountabilities policies objectives and the strategies that that is in place um, to achieve them the capabilities and I will speak about that a bit later the capabilities of the resources that one has got and that is to do with the knowledge or to do with the capital time people the processes systems and technologies information systems information flows and decision making processes both formal and informal and both in a normal environment as well as in an abnormal environment the relationships with and perceptions and values of internal stakeholders and this is a, a fairly um, sensitive one if one is looking from a security perspective but you don't understand the in, the enterprise risk environmental experience and then lastly the organizational culture that exists um, in that specific environment external context on ISO 73 explains the the external um, environment in which the organization seeks to achieve its, its objectives now that has to do with with um, the cultural social the political the legal the financial te technological uh, whether it is on a national regional or a local um, environment um, so that is fairly fairly big and we are speaking there about various models what one of them is the the pestel model um, the second one is the key drivers and trends having impact on the objectives of the, the organization and for that one needs to have an, an analysis of the key drivers and the trends and thirdly the, the relationships with and the perceptions and values of external stakeholders now that is a fairly difficult one to 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 pinpoint and to assess and but if one has got the correct um, uh, information flows and um, structures that you can consult one can get the perceptions and values of them I want to to introduce you to 
the two case studies that that I've been in uh, um, that has been happening over the last two uh, yeah two to three years and and that that I was involved in after the fact um, to go and assess various um, the stakeholder the stakeholder environment the security environment versus the enterprise risk um, environment and if we if we look at at the first one on your left hand side with the the, the security um, person that is standing there at an open groove mine in Tanzania and on your right hand side you will see the um, the policing environment there and people lying on the ground this is um, uh, an actual environment that has actually caused 30, um, 36 people to be to be killed on the left hand side it is about 67 people killed and 200 and, and something um, people that were injured um, over about 12 months and the effect of that uh, on uh, the comments at at the bottom of of the slide has to do with the killings at the mine in 2011 and 2013 several vill villages we entered the mine area looking for gold, were killed by police officers assigned to, to support the mine security guards. Now, I just want to, to, um, to stop there. This mine on the left-hand side is based in Tanzania. It is an open groove mine. It is a gold mine. Really, it is a gold mine. It is, it is mining gold. And the open groove mine is, is in the village of a very poor village. Now, um, the mining company that has been working there were not looking at 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 at, at the security operations as as a, a critical factor for them to actually operate at that mine itself. And during the operations, um, the villagers were actually mining next to the mining personnel. So when the mining personnel were given an instruction of there's a, a um, a blast that is going to be happening, the community members did not know about it. And through that um, non-communication and stakeholder management that was extremely poor, um, people lost their lives, um, firstly, and a lot of people were injured. And the court case that, that, that was then implemented um, caused um, the mine to reconsider, to actually escalate the security operations management from a very low level on the risk profile of 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 um, uh, the company to actually number one at all the mines within the specific country. Now I will I will get get back to that one a bit later. Um, clashes with stakeholders. As I was speaking there, um, the Marikana mine in South Africa. What happened there was people were striking and and um they 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 were they were striking um for normal things it is it is a normal negotiation process in south africa or southern africa to strike and 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 to demand um wages to demand benefits etc and that whole strike um escalated out of out of the the the, the environment of uh, the control of the security environment, the enterprise risk um, structure were not were not managing that well. The communication structure were not managing that well at all, and they brought in uh, the police services. And with this tension that was coming in, um, the clashes happened, and um, there were a lot of a lot of killings, and that has actually made the the whole platinum mine industry to actually fall um, in turnover with within days. The North Mara mine in Tanzania, the one that I was speaking about just earlier, the clashes were not were not only within the open groove mine. It was also in at the dumping site on a mine where you are dumping all, all the the discarded the discarded um, um, ground and 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 rocks and this is where um, the community were actually actually scavenging 
for the gold dust and and for um, for gold particles that they could salvage because they are poor. Now you've got the rich in the mine and you've got the poor that, that is that is in in the village and that environment of not understanding your your external environment and there was at that time there was no stakeholder analysis done there was no stakeholder communication done there was there was very limited interaction between the mine and um, the community itself um, and 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 actually if you're looking at the stakeholders the stakeholders were actually owning um, the property there but they were totally excluded out of the profits out of everything else and um, the deaths that that occurred there um, was published in various newspapers so this is this is open communication it is not um, some communication that 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 I am only privileged to it is open communication that you can can go and look at in any newspaper um, that published that the third one that that I want to to be addressing they just briefly is um, hospitals hospitals are vulnerable hospitals are vulnerable places where people that is that is sick are coming in and and if the security and usually the security is not very good at the hospitals because people are rushing in there we've been um, conducting risk assessments from from a security point of view as well as from an enterprise risk management point of view um, over over um, a few hospitals um, in Southern Africa and um, where gang fights occurred in the community, that external stakeholder um, is then, um, the victim is then brought to the hospital and with everything that is happening, they firstly the emergency services that is now responding to the security, in, uh, um, the, the criminal incident in the community are under pressure and are under attack and then when that person is then taken to either the hospital intensive care or anywhere else they are then actually force forcing themselves into um, the operating rooms firstly secondly the ICU and putting everybody in the hospital in, um, in danger in the Barry case in Tanzania um, the commercial there was a commercial ban uh, placed on exports. I, I, I conducted um, the audit in 2016. And what the situation at that time was that expats, mostly expats, were working on the mine. And the, they, they only had the localization process of the people were, were limited. And it was, it was a process that, it, that, that was not, not enforced. Um, it was um, as you go along, please um, implement the localization process itself. Now, I was there in 2016, and in um, April of 2017, uh, the president of, of Tanzania um, put a commercial export ban on all, uh, on all the gold concentrate out of Tanzania. Now, immediately, Barrick Gold has got three mines. In Tanzania, North Mara, Bulangkulu, and another one in the middle of of Tanzania. All three mines are sitting with, firstly, and uh, because of the reputational um, impact that that a bad security structure had, um, that had a knock-on effect, specifically on the operations. The operations is now affecting the financial. Um, having a financial consequence and the question is will Barrick um, see out this year um, in Tanzania or are they are they going to be closing down if they are going to be um, surviving this year uh, the chances are good that 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 they that they are are getting funding from somewhere else Marikana if you look at the Marikana incident the violent scenes at the Lonman Marikana mine could shake investor confidence. That has happened specifically, and that has resulted in 18% decrease in share prices. And that is billions, billions of US dollars 
lost um, for, for the mine, as well as the knock-on effect of that is that people has lost their, 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 um, their work. Uh, they were a retention process, they were a restructuring process, and, and, and because of, of the poor management of the external stakeholders, um, where if you're looking at the security operations management, you're looking at the, the incidents that are reported, you're looking at intelligence that you are gathering within the community, you are, you are looking at the, 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 the stakeholder engagement on an, on an external basis, that you can actually gather information to have preemptive and, and proactive information for the decision makers to make decisions about what is going to happen and not to wait and see what, um, what is happening and then to be in a reactive state um, that, that you're working um, on a security process or implement security procedures that is actually in an emergency environment it is always going to go wrong now if you're looking at a security environment that is a huge cost to a company because you're looking at resources that is people you you're looking at processes you're looking at technology technology is costing um the inter the integration of access control of cctv systems of every system that you are actually working with to make sure that that you are you are looking after the people and the assets of the company is costing a bundle and if you don't use that optimally you are going to sit with a very unstable uh, risk environment that if business is only looking at security as as a as a support system um, to call in even when needed um, the risk management process are then going to be failing the effect of this is human rights. Now, I'm going to address two things, human rights and the use of force. Firstly, human rights is, is entrenched in, in every, every environment that we um, are engaging in, whether it is uh, in aviation, whether it is in um, the banking environment, whether it is in, in, in the, the transport, logistics, um, vehicle environment, human rights are everywhere. And the, the forerunner of human rights to make sure that human rights are being complied with is the security structure uh, within an entity. Now, they are voluntary principles, on, um, voluntary security principles for human rights that one can, can start implementing. Uh, but just to get back to the human rights issue, it is to establish and maintain a transparent governance and management framework in order to deter, detect, monitor, address, and prevent the occurrence and reoccurrence of incidents that have ad adverse impacts on human rights and fundamental freedoms. Secondly, identify and operate in accordance with applicable international, national, and local laws and regulations. That is a big statement because it is not only in your own environment, you must also look further and past your own environment. Thirdly, conduct comprehensive internal and internal risk assessments associated with safety, security, and human rights risks. Now, I can guarantee you that, that if one is, is taking a population in an enterprise risk environment, with, uh, um, as I was saying, let's use the banking, the aviation, uh, the transport, and logistics. I, I haven't, I haven't seen at 80% of those places, I haven't seen a comprehensive internal and external risk assessment done um, on the human rights. Third, fourthly, implement risk control measures that support the rule of law, respect human rights of stakeholders and protect the interest, interests of the organization and its clients and provide professional services. That's a tall order. And if every one of those um, uh, controls are being measured against the control effectiveness of the rule of law, the respect of human rights of the stakeholders, and to protect the interests of the, of the organization, I think enterprise risk management should take this as a very serious um, 
indicator of how strong the security operations management are actually working or not working. The next point is ensure suitable and sufficient operational controls based on identified risks um, are implemented and managed to enhance the occupational health and safety and the welfare of persons working on behalf of the organization. Now, this is the interface and dependency and interdependency that, that, we, are, that we are speaking about the operational functionaries, which is the security operations management as well as safety operations management. And usually in, 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 in some organizations, health and safety and security are in the same portfolio. So if one is looking at, at those suitable and sufficient operational controls in those environments, um, occupational health and safety, I haven't seen um, a human rights risk assessment done. I've seen a lot of others, but not on the human rights. Effectively, with public and private stakeholders, communicate and consult. This is where the, the wheels come, come off um, spe specifically in the security environment. Security environment is speaking, is easily addressing the internal control environment as well as the internal stakeholders. But they don't want to, to engage or they are engaging as, as a, a spectator uh, with, the, with the public and the private stakeholders. Um, and in the case of, of Barrick uh, in Tanzania, what they have done there is that, that they have actually seconded the, communi the communications um, officers that has got nothing to do with either health or safety or security to actually go and consult and communicate with the public and private stakeholders. Now, this is immediately a disconnect. This is a disconnect between what is the expectations, what decisions one is making um, on the stakeholders and for the stakeholders, and that creates a huge gap that neither party are actually getting closer to each other. It is that you are working through a conduit and that conduit is actually um, not, not addressing or can make decisions um, on the spot, on the go, and has first-hand information that can actually make sure that a relationship is built with the stakeholders. And then conduct effective screening and training of persons working on the, the organization's behalf. Now, effective screening and training. Screening, pre-employment screening, as well as in-employment screening is extremely important. Now, I've been working with, 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 um, with companies that, that, that is um, being categorized as, as national key points. Uh, that is uh, your, the international um, airports, as well as the energy suppliers of countries. We're talking about uh, the Central Reserve Bank. And, and what, we have, what we have seen there is that firstly, screening is done possibly once, just before employment. In employment screening is not happening and it is not happening um, because of processes, but also because people don't understand the internal risk environment and the, the threat to, to the insider within the organization that can actually um, take out information that can affect um, the reputation, operations, and the legal environment. And the training on that is also very important. Then go over to uh, the next slide, is to ensure that the use of force is reasonably necessary and proportional and lawful. Now, we conducted a, an audit about two weeks ago um, at a mining environment where um, there was also a, a, a stoppage of work, a strike, and the security in that environment um, were actually with a presence with a presence of some of some of the sec security um, tools and equipment were actually creating an unstable environment, and the use of force immediately escalated from a a standing position to shoot, uh, not to kill, but to shoot, and they have killed um, two to three, two to three people, and they they have injured a number. And the question there is, 
proportionality. If your life is not in danger and you are sitting in a in 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 a with with a bulletproof vest, etc., and you are fully weaponized, and and the person that is um, opposing you, um, if that is not a direct threat on your life, proportionality can can be very uh, is very difficult to explain them, and then it makes it unlawful. Conduct performance evaluations of service ren services rendered and the achievement of objectives. The performance evaluations need to be aligned with the human rights. The performance ev evaluation need to be aligned with every deliverable in the human rights spectrum, as it is, it, is, it is stated here, but also as it is actually taken out of ISO 18788, that is the Security Operations Man Management System um, that, that, that was published in, in 2015. And then develop and implement systems for reporting and investigating allegations of violations of international law, local law, or human rights, as well as mitigating and remedying the consequences of undesirable or, or disruptive events. Reporting and investigating. Firstly, on reporting. Very, it is a big requirement within ISO 31000, uh, if you look at um, uh, clause 5.7 of ISO 31000, that the recording and reporting of incidents is extremely important. Whether you are in an, an environmental environment, whether you are, you, are, you are in an HR environment, whether you are in a security environment, a safety environment, the recording and the reporting of those um, incidents is of extreme importance. And with the investigation of it, um, it, is, it is then also looking at the cause and effect um, to understand what is causing it, that you can continuously improve and to make sure that what you are doing is not going to repeat itself in the future. And if there's any violations um, or allegations of violations within the legal environment, that that is addressed and that you are going back again to the training and um, the awareness um, of the total environment, uh, and that includes your internal stakeholders as well as your external stakeholders. If you're looking at the seven indicators of voluntary principles on security and human rights, you will see there that one is looking at labor and working conditions. This is what, what we are auditing um, in terms of the VRS HR. Um, the second one is indigenous people localization. Now, if you're going in into Africa and you are you you are you are working um, on a mine, the chances is about 80% that either um, it is owned by a, a global company and that the localization is only on on certain levels and all the other levels of the organization are then um, occupied by either expats or uh, people that that has been earmarked specifically for those positions. The, the third indicator is economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, this is where the human rights are coming in, and this is where the respect of your stakeholders and within your internal and external stakeholders need to be balanced. The fourth one is environment, environment and health and safety. That needs to be, that is a standard across the world that is mandatory and, and, and not an elective. Um, so that needs to be implemented and that uh, needs to be uh, measured on the forefront and making sure that that the environment is set and it is conducive for a good health and safety environment. The fifth one is land rights. Land rights specific, um, specifically linked to the indigenous people is that land rights are rights that that needs to be assessed and one needs to to respect that. Most of the the mining environments has to do with some kind of, of land rights that you are working within and that there is either a chief or um, some, some kind of um, structure within your external stakeholder environment that you need to consult with, that you need to work with, that you need to, to incorporate with. Number six is back again to the security. The security not only of the operations within the mine, but also the security of your stakeholders, the security of your 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 
um, your, your, your working environment, of your eco economic and social and cultural rights, and working specifically with health, health and safety. Because if that is not um, incorporated, and if, if, that is, if these seven pillars are not um, working together in tandem and working in silos, it is not having the correct effect. And then lastly, number seven, anti-corruption. Now, anti-corruption and bribery, um, also one of uh, the ISO standards, 37001, um, is extremely important because within the localization process, you need to make provision for the buying of certain um, provisions or certain goods and services from the local community to make sure that your labor and working conditions for everybody as well as your economic, social and cultural rights are being protected with an anti-corruption process that you are in charge of it and, and that that is not um, affecting the enterprise risk environment. And this has to do with specifically with security and human rights. Now, this is a fantastic process to actually have and to market oneself in, in um, to say that human rights is in the forefront of one's business and one um, is looking with specific attention to that. If you go over to the recommendations, firstly, due, due diligence. Due diligence is extremely important for to develop the, the supplier code of ethics. Secondly, investigate and audit of the contractors. Um, that needs to be done on each and every level. There's missing contractors who fail to comply with the policies or the law, that is the reporting and the incidents and the risk assessment in the supply chain. Now, this is where ISO 18708, ISO 31000 and ISO 28000 um, is taking hands and looking at the, secure, the security in the supply chain for anti-corruption uh, or no bribery activities. Environmental monitoring along with policies, procedures and a management system that includes audits and, uh, and assessments and the enhanced enhanced human resources policies, um, procedures and training related to sexual harassment and discrimination more generally. I want to touch on the use of force. Security are usually, if you, if you are looking at security all over the world, whether it is at an, at an airport in transit, if, it's, if, if it is at a bank, security are trained to protect the assets and the people that is their most important job. Now, if one is looking at the process of the escalation of force, the escalation of force, as in this diagram, it has got various levels that one needs to needs to um, to address. And on the left hand side, one can see that it is a compliant structure. Then, secondly, it is a passive or a resistance structure, um, an active or and a, a resistant um, activity, then assaultive, uh, and that is causing bodily harm, and then assaultive, serious bodily harm, and that can it can go uh, over into this, and that is to do with your your lethal environment, harmful, um, etc. And on the next page, you will see that this is the the various um, six levels. Um, of defense and the controls that is being implemented um, as a standard globally to say, step one, the officer's presence in the uniform must have some kind of, um, of, of, of assurance to say that the officer's presence need to, to be respected. Secondly, the verbal commands, if, if it is escalating and not respected, the second description there is verbal commands and cooperative controls. And the defense and the control techniques there um, is a whole list that, that has to do with the compliance, the pressure points and the control um, tactics, escort techniques that is specifically to do with um, in, in uh, the protection of people, the protection of, of, of assets in transit. Um, and then um, to go over into the force option num number three with the description of empty hand submission um, techniques and that is to do with the pressure point control tactics control tactic um, techniques 
a level of force that has a low probability of causing soft connective tissue damage or bone fractures. So you can see immediately if you're looking at the use of force, the use of force has got a direct impact on, on the consequences on a legal and on a legal environment, it, it, it will have definitely, it will reach the newspapers and a reputational risk is evident. If you go over to force option number four, it is hard control techniques or aggressive response techniques. Now you can see there it is described there with pepper spray and with anything to do with um, uh, to irritate the skin, the eyes and mucus. Um, so, it, and it has, it has got everything as well to do with level level five, level five of of the um, the environment. Um, and then we are going over to to level five intermediate weapons, um, an amount of force that would have a high probability of causing soft connecting tissue damage or bone fractures. That will definitely land in the reputational damage or consequence for a company, firstly, and secondly, there will be legal action taken there. And then going over to the lethal force, uh, that, that is the basis of the two case studies that I was discussing there, the legal force or deadly force with high probability of causing death or serious bodily harm and injury. You don't want to, want to have that because that is going to be keeping you as a risk manager, as a security manager, as a safety manager that's going to keep you so busy in litigation that you are going to have a huge impact on operations itself. I want to speak lastly about the, su the supply chain contracting because that has for me a direct impact on, um, on bribery and anti-corruption and um, one needs to, to look at the relationships between the the direct line of of the procurement versus what you are doing um, and what is what, what is your, your supply chain contractors universe or risk universe that you are working with. And within the system that we are using, uh, it, it enables you to ask the right questions. Um, and these questions has got a variety of, of, um, of benefits because you, you can see three, four, five, six levels down to determine what is the next of king that is involved in the procurement process. What is the business partners that is involved in it? What is the, the secondary and, and third level of fronting uh, that one has got and um, how one can actually analyze that and get to a well reporting system that you can with confidence understand what is your, the value chain that you've got within your environment, uh, within your subcontracting environment and that you know what is your risk environment. And this is, this is usually to do with the security environment. Now, this impact uh, is, is tremendously on the enterprise risk environment because if tender fraud um, is occurring, it is going to be um, a question for the risk manager or for the internal auditor or for the CEO to be answering that. If you're looking at competencies and training, now if, you, if you're looking at, at this um, picture um, of the PCB, that is firstly looking at competence is the ability to implement knowledge and skills to achieve intended results. That is a mouthful, but that has to be understood in firstly the context. Does the people know the context? Now on a mine, when you are working with expats, do they know the context? They know the context, what they are working within, but they don't know the context of the internal and external stakeholders. Now that has to do with specifically knowledge, skills, and the behavioral skills. And with that the whole combination there, you cannot sit with only one of the, the dimensions. There are four dimensions there that is actually making that a person is competent and that competency is in the middle of the page there. And re research has indicated or shown that knowledge is what, what you have built over uh, many years through your studies, et cetera. Skills is in a specific, in a specific um, discipline or environment. 
and behavior 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 um, is how does the people act um, now knowledge contributes to this whole competency framework about 10 percent skills about 20 percent and behavior about 70 percent but if you don't know the context that you are working in you are not going to be doing it correctly then lastly the last slide is how do you do how do you conduct internal audit and how does the internal audit environment um, addresses security operations specifically now if if an internal auditor if an internal auditor that is following policies and procedures and the, the policies and procedures of a security operations are written badly what can he audit he doesn't know the specific context of the, the security environment specifically to do with the critical competence on security and then the need to know for an internal auditor or for an internal auditor that is auditing the security operations the technical environment he has to have knowledge and skills regarding the range of systems available for implementation the security technology is the fastest growing industry glo globally and keep current and relevant if you are not current and relevant you are going to audit old technology that is not going to, to to have the correct effects and then the operational environment the context and then there are some security principles that is also policing principles that one needs to needs to audit to determine what is the crime prevention through environmental design and how is this incorporated in your policies procedures and in your your structures how do you work with a zero tolerance approach in line with the human rights and in line with, with um, the use of force continuum and how do you apply the broken window principle and how does an internal auditor which hasn't got these kind of auditing skills is not going to understand the security environment and the result of his audit is, is not going to be valid i hand over to you Adrian. Thank you, Nico, for this great presentation. I want to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 31000 Introduction, Foundation, Risk Manager, and Lead Risk Manager. A PCB certificate will exemplify your dedication in implementing and managing the risk management processes, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from the attendees. The first question is, is risk management regarded by everyone as essential for the achievement of objectives? Um, are there other people on the panel? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, did you hear the question from the attendee? Yes, I, I, I did. Um, I, I would say if you don't have objectives, where do you work to? I've been um, I've been auditing um, over over the last ten years, and the first question that I'm I am I am asking people uh, that I'm going into an environment is what is the the objectives? Because the objectives are linked to a strategy. A strategy is linked to a mission and a vision. And if the organization is driving objectives, then Everything that that is affecting um, that has got an a, an effect on and creating uncertainty on the objectives that needs to be addressed as a risk, whether it is positive or negative. Um, so so and that has to be measured in terms of consequences and likelihood. So if you if you don't have objectives, um, and every everybody has got whether they are in a in a company or they are in a personal capacity they have got objectives you you must just be in a position to formulate that um, just to give you an example one of the companies that that I um, am auditing now they had objectives but they but they have put it as a, a bench document away for about a year and the whole structure of, of about 18 90 people um, were running around um, headless they don't know where are they going to and the, the simple four objectives that they had that we brought out in October, November of last year has caused direction, it has caused, caused a purpose, it has caused a measurement that we can actually determine the level of risk as well as the level of assurance. 
and that we can understand precisely what are, are we doing and what do we do to drive the objectives to create a conducive environment for that company to be working in. So my, my answer is definitely there has to be objectives. Thank you, Nico. Now, to add to that question is another related question. Uh, is risk management viewed by management as an integral part of management and their responsibilities? I think that depends on the maturity of the company. If a, if, if, if a company is not mature enough to understand uh, that risk management is actually part and parcel of strategic management, uh, then, then, then they, they, are, they are not going to, to see risk management as an integral part of, part of the, um, the organizational uh, business, as well as the driving of the objectives. If one is looking at the, the integration of risk management, um, one needs to look at, at SOX compliance. You need to look at, at King4 compliance. You need to look at, at other compliance structures now as well. And if you're looking at the ISO um, systems or ISO standards, ISO 9001 on quality management, it is now a risk-based approach. If you're looking at, at environmental management, 14001, it is a risk-based approach. If you're looking at um, 18,000 that went over into 45,001, it is a risk-based approach. So everything, everything is starting to be, to be linked to risk, and risk is linked to objectives, and objectives is linked to strategy, vision, and mission. Thank you, Nico. Now, because of the time limitation, we will only answer one more question, and the rest of the questions will be answered by email by Nico. The last question is, can organizations adopt ILO human rights conventions for their operations? The question that I would um, answer back is, if, if, one is if, if one is looking at the, the standards and the structures for the, the adopting of um, the human rights uh, it needs to be aligned with the practical application within that specific country and within the specific laws and regulations of that specific country. So if, um, if, if there is some kind of second level or third level on the three li lines of defense process of, um, of independence in the evaluation of the ILO um, adopting of the human rights and the evaluation and the, the reporting on it and the continuous improvement of that, then I would I would say that that you've got a mitigation process and and a risk treatment plan because you are managing risk, whether it is a human rights um, risk or any other kind of risk, you need to treat it as a risk and the the um, the human rights that is applicable in that specific country needs to be assessed and needs to be evaluated. And if you're doing it independently, I would say that you've got an answer there for yourself. Thank you, Nico, again for this great presentation and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I would like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. Also, since we were talking about risk management, I would like to remind you that PCB is continuing with its efforts to establish PCB University, which will offer MBA and graduate certificate programs. Among the list of program offerings, we will also offer a graduate certificate in risk management. Currently, we're awaiting institutional license, but we believe that we will be able to follow up with the news on our operating status by the beginning of the second half of 2018. For this and more information, you can contact us at university at pcb.com or visit our website www.pcb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.